morning. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, I see thumbs up. Good morning and welcome to Olivet Swankfelder United Church of Christ. We are an open and affirming community of faith where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We do have a few announcements to share, uh, including some general housekeeping. Um, as you know, we are now temporarily, temporarily, only having outdoor parking lot services due to the post-holiday COVID surge. However, those numbers are beginning to inch ever so slightly downward. So it is our hope that we will be returning to our normal schedule in the near future. If you would like to receive a robocall for any worship changes, whether due to COVID or inclement weather, please contact the church office so that you may, may be included in our church directory, either as a member or even just as a friend of our congregation. A note about those robocalls. If you do have a spam blocker on your line or are on a no call list, our robocalls may not get through to you. If that is the case and you have internet access you can always get the most updated worship information on the church's Facebook page. And again, as a reminder, you do not need to have a Facebook account. You can literally just Google our page and go and check out any last minute announcements due to the virus or again, any winter weather events. Uh, despite being apart from each other, uh, we still were able to donate a large number of items to Bethany Children's Home uh, for the Christmas season. We have received as a congregation a special gift in gratitude from Bethany Children's Home. It is a coaster that was hand painted by one of the children at Bethany. And so I am grateful to each and every one of you for making their spirits bright and to Everett and Lee for taking the donations. Our January mission project continues to be the Norristown Hospitality Center. We are collecting specifically ground coffee hot chocolate, and those little chemical hand warmer pouches. If you are out and about, if you see any sales of those items, you can drop them off day or night right here in our donation bin. And thank you to those who have already given. We continue to have adult Bible study on Women of the Bible every Wednesday at 6 p.m. over Zoom. And at 7 o'clock every Wednesday night, we have a Zoom prayer meeting. Anyone is welcome. You can check in and share whatever concerns are weighing heavy on your heart. Seeing as there are no other announcements to share this morning, let us be in the spirit of worship together. The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night declares knowledge. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The law of the Lord uh, are sure, making wise the simple. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Our first hymn this morning is Rain Down, all three verses. Thank you. 
people of God say, Amen. Christ Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news. May we also be called God's anointed ones as we seek to live out the good news of Jesus. May the Holy Spirit also be upon us as we seek to worship and partnership with Christians around the world. Amen. Each and every one of us, from sun up to sun down, has a mission, a calling, and a duty that oftentimes we try to ignore. Join me as together we confess. We confess that we have yet to overcome many of our sharpest differences, that we are too quick to criticize, that we are slow to listen and to learn what we have to teach one another. God, have mercy upon us. In your grace, transform us. By the guidance of your Holy Spirit, lead us to mutual understanding and a common purpose rooted in the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Siblings in Christ, the good news is that there is nothing, not heights, depths, rulers, things present or things to come, that can keep us from the love of God. In the name of Christ Jesus, our sins are forgiven. Let us take a moment to prepare our hearts and our minds for God's truth in the scripture. Amen. Our first lesson this morning is Psalm 19. Hear these words. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech at night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than they, than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And our gospel lesson today is from Luke chapter 4, beginning with verse 14. Hear these words. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread all throughout the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. Now when he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. 
He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. Now the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here also in your hometown the things that we've heard that you did in Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were, ve there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a severe famine over the land. Yet, Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to a brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I'm guessing that I am not the only one who is a little bit chilly this morning, gathered here in God's beautiful natural sanctuary in this beautiful natural 22 degree weather. <laughs> But I would also venture a guess that many of us this morning woke up warm in bed, in homes that were heated. I'd further venture a guess that many of you gathered today had a nice scrumptious breakfast this morning and that you were able to fill your cars with gasoline so that you could keep the heat on during today's sermon. What I'm getting at is that, for the most part, many of us have never really experienced extreme poverty. We slept in a warm bed, in a warm house, ate a breakfast, rode in a warm car to be here together. And those worshiping from home <laughs> are perhaps still warm in their beds, wrapped up in blankets. Now today's scripture is about poverty, and in fact God's special affection for poor people. It can be difficult to think about God taking sides. In fact, that can rub us the wrong way. We like to think that God loves everyone equally, and indeed God does love everyone equally. And yet, we still have and worship a God who nevertheless takes the side of the oppressed and the poor. And we hear this again and again in Scripture. Now, 
Today, there are well over 90 countries around the world where the per capita GDP, that's gross domestic product, is less than $5,000 a year. A lot of those, the per capita GDP is less than 2000 a year. And believe it or not, there are some on the list of nations where the GDP is less than $500 a year. I lived briefly in one of those countries, Sierra Leone, which at the time I was there had a per capita gross domestic product of right around or less than $400 a year. Now, I had just graduated from undergraduate. And in fact, when I say just graduated, I mean, I got my diploma in May, and within a week to two weeks was on a plane to a war torn nation. At the time, Sierra Leone had officially declared a ceasefire in its civil war. Perhaps you vaguely recall news from many years ago. News about conflict diamonds, also called blood diamonds. News about child soldiers. News about the horrible atrocities that were happening on, in Sierra Leone and just across the border in Liberia. When I went to Sierra Leone with the International Medical Corps, it was, as I said, after the official ceasefire, but yet months before disarmament, which meant that there were still rebels who were wielding weapons. The infrastructure was more or less non-existent. We had a few generators, but to be honest, they maybe worked one or two days out of the week. And there was literally no food to be found outside of the main cities and urban centers like Freetown. In the east of Sierra Leone, on the border with Liberia, was one of the last Bastions, one of the last holdouts of fighting in Kailahun District. And I traveled out to Kailahun District and remember that there was literally nothing to eat. There just was nothing to eat. You could not buy small baked breads. You could not get food. Nobody had animals that you could get eggs from. The only place there was to eat was at the UN Peacekeepers Headquarters of the Pakistani Army. It was such an awakening for me. I have known that there are places in the world that are not nearly as blessed as the United States. That is an understatement. But to physically be in a place where there just was no food, where fields had been burned, livestock had been slaughtered, and no one had a thing to eat was just beyond my realm of experience. Here in our very wealthy nation, the poorest of the poor earn less than $10,000 per household a year. And that is over 10% of our population. Now poverty here in our country has actually decreased. Way back in 1963, the poorest people in our nation were people who were over 65. Right? 28% of retired folks over 65 were below poverty level in 1963. Now the poverty rate for our elderly is closer to about 
The government's war on poverty began by President Lyndon Johnson. They tried to make a positive difference for large numbers of people, especially our elderly. And as I said, they were successful, but over the years, the face of poverty in our country has changed. The new poor in America are no longer the elderly, but are single mothers with children. If you want to get a feeling for poverty and what it means to be poor, simply talk to certain single mothers with kids and you will get a first-hand lesson on what that experience is like. More and more often in our country, we also have what are called the working poor. People who work two, three, even four jobs and are still not able to make enough money to subsist, to pay both for housing as well as for food and medicine. Often the working poor, the homeless, these folks don't often belong to our churches. And so sometimes we don't hear those stories. Sometimes we need to be reminded that God is with them in particular. Now this morning's gospel lesson is the first event in Jesus' public ministry, according to Luke anyway. Jesus had just been baptized, went out into the wilderness, was tempted by the devil, and now he was ready for the first event in his public ministry. And this was Jesus' very first sermon in his hometown crowd of Nazareth, where he had been brought up. Think about it. All of these people had been his neighbors. They had seen Jesus come up as a little boy. Now he was a grown man and preaching his first sermon in the synagogue. What would Jesus say in this first sermon? Well, it had to be important, right? I'm sure he wanted to make an impact. As a guest preacher in the synagogue, Jesus was free to choose whatever passage he wanted to from the prophets. He was allowed to preach on whatever the Spirit moved him. So, what did Jesus choose for his very first sermon? What passage? Did anybody pick up? He quoted the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the good news to the poor people. Proclaim release to those who are in captivity. Recover the sight of the blind and free those who are oppressed. For his very first public message in his own hometown, Jesus chose Isaiah 61 and said, I am going to be a servant. I am going to take care and heal the poor, the blind, the lame, and the maimed. Jesus said, I have come to bring good news to poor people. You know, the lepers, the blind, the lame, the poor, they were all rejected in Jesus' society. These were the social outcasts. They were the ones not sitting in the pews, in the synagogue. They were ostracized. They would not come to the temple, not come to the synagogue. They could not be part of the Jewish society and in many ways, it is the same way today. Our American poor rarely are sitting alongside of us, whether in the pews or in our cars. And for some, it is literally because they cannot afford the extra gasoline to drive to our worship services. Now, sometimes it's annoying, right? We even hear the disciples of Jesus, right? The idea that the poor are always with us. Oh, it's another, another sermon about helping those in need. But the fact remains that God has 
this very special relationship and incarnate, embodied in Christ. God has a mission. God didn't just come down here to give us some good good teachings and good uh, good stories to tell. There was a mission. And it was to ensure that each and every beloved person that God has created is able to have a full belly, able to sleep in warmth, able to get health care and medicine. Because we are all worthy of intrinsic human dignity. It was a mission that God put on flesh. And now that that flesh, Jesus Christ, has returned to God, we are God's hands and feet. And we are called to continue that mission. I want you to consider this week in what ways you are or maybe are not as open to the plight of others who are poor. Do you grumble sometimes? Do we occasionally put our own baggage onto the poor, making assumptions, oh, they're just lazy, oh, they want higher wages than they really deserve? Do we sometimes think those things? Or when we see somebody panhandling, somebody begging, do we turn aside because we make assumptions about them for the worst? That obviously this throwaway human being would only waste our money on drugs or alcohol. Do we do that? Do we assume the worst of people just because they were born into a different home, into a different family than we were. Today we hear about Jesus' first sermon. Let us take to heart the topic he chose and remember that we are called and commissioned to do the work of helping those in need. Amen. At this time, we are going to turn our hearts and our minds to God in prayer. We have a number of prayer requests to share today. we have some joys to thank God for. I am grateful that my godson up in Massachusetts, who was diagnosed with COVID a week ago, never became symptomatic and is back in school and healthy, and I give thanks to God for that. A number of people have given thanks that Despite the current situation in our world, and despite the pandemic, we are still able to gather, share the love of Christ, and make a difference in our missions. So, alleluia to that. However, we also have prayer requests, hurts, and fears that we ask that God make easier and that God heal. Today we lift up Scott for strength and healing. We continue to pray for Merle who remains on the transplant list. We pray for anonymous friends and members who are dealing with difficult diagnoses like cancer or cancer treatments. We ask prayers for Tony's mother, Connie as well as Donna, his sister. We ask prayers for Dave, his brother, Chris, as well as his father, 
who is struggling, especially today with grief, we ask God's comfort and peace be with them. We pray for Lane recovering from a stroke. We pray for Sandy with pancreatic cancer. Chuck, who's dealing with ALS. We pray for Deb for an end to pain and also comfort in spirit. We continue to pray for our preschool director, Mary Ann, and her healing. We still lift up Ben, who is recovering from COVID, literally after months of being ill. And we pray not only for Ben, but all of those who are dealing with long COVID. We lift up Florence and Larry. We lift up Tom as he deals with medical issues. We continue to pray for that 13-year-old girl, Anna, who is struck by a car but is improving. And finally, we lift to God prayers for our member, Dennis, whose sister died over this past week. Let us pray. Gracious God, hear all of these concerns, all of these hurts and worries that we bring with us. We ask that you continue to pour out your healing upon us, this congregation, and this world. Be with all of those who are sick with COVID, not just here in our wealthy nation of antivirals and respirators, but in other countries where there is no medicine to be had, no electricity to run the machines. Oh Lord, we ask this day that you heal us not just in body, but mind and spirit. We name to you those dealing with memory loss or dementia, those who are grieving or struggling with loneliness, all who are depressed or anxious, who are dealing with thoughts of suicide, eating disorders, or addictions of any form. We are reminded, God, that your healing knows no bounds and that you are able to smooth all of our rough and hurting places. Finally, God, we turn our hearts to our world, particularly those who are still lost or suffering following the underwater volcano off the coast of Tonga. Be wherever there is disaster, Provide hope, we pray, in the name of Christ, our living Savior who taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our final hymn is in Christ. There is no east or west. Harkening back to that first sermon of Jesus. I want to remind you that following our benediction, Cars and vehicles can exit our parking lot starting from the back row on this side. Go slowly so that we may wave and share the love of Christ with one another.
And now, go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted and honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.